Welcome once again to Anatomy and Physiology at Glen Oaks Community College. I'm Dr. Ren Hartung. And for this video, I'd like to do uh, the sliding filament theory. And I have to warn you, I can do drawings, but the animations are usually much better for trying to understand it. So um, there's other videos that I've put within this playlist, or there should be, that I've taken from other places on YouTube that are nice animations of the sliding filament theory. OK. First, let's remember where we are. We're in a circle mirror. And again, these are the little black filaments or the actin filaments. And let me draw a red myosin filament. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to snatch a piece of this and blow it up. I want to blow it up bigger than that. I want a big box. OK. So what we've got in here is the actin filament. and the myosin filament. And there's a couple other things that we need. We're going to need ATP, and we're going to need calcium. Remember that the last thing that we did in excitation contraction coupling was say that the action potential moving down a T-tubule causes calcium to be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And that increases calcium levels in this region here, inside of the muscle cell. That calcium is going to increase around these actin and myosin filaments. The myosin filament has myosin head groups, also known as myosin cross bridges, that can connect to the actin. But, and I need another color, so I'm going for a blue marker. Before those myosin head groups can bind, before we jump to that, there's a protein complex that's on the actin. It's called troponin tropomyosin complex. The little purple circles I'm drawing are the troponin, and the blue line is the tropomyosin. I hope you can see that. Um, calcium comes in and it binds to the tropomyosin. When the calcium binds to the tropomyosin, it causes a shape change. And ultimately, what the tropomyosin does is it moves troponin off of the myosin binding sites on actin. So get this. Before calcium was around, myosin can't bind to actin because the binding sites for myosin on actin are covered up by tropomyosin. With calcium, though, the calcium comes down and binds to troponin. The troponin then moves the tropomyosin off of the binding, by binding sites. So that calcium binding to troponin is our link between excitation contraction coupling and this actual mechanical motion that's going to happen. All right. So somehow I got to try and show that the tropomyosin is moved off the myosin binding sites and I'll just erase part of the blue. Okay, now for the head groups I'm going to I'm going to rebuild my myosin because I don't have enough room. So 
Something you should know about the myosin head groups at this point. They have, at, during the resting phase, they have um, adenosine diphosphate and phosphate in here, especially the phosphate. They're phosphorylated. And this phosphorylation has actually caused their shape to be more like this. So again, here's the phosphate. I think what I'll try here is to make multiple myosin cross bridges. The binding sites are open, recall. What that allows is for the myosin cross bridge to bind to its binding site on the actin. This binding is going to cause this phosphate group to leave. And with the phosphate group gone, the myosin changes its shape like this. And remember, it's bound to the actin. So basically, let's pretend that this marker cap is the phosphate group, and my hand is the myosin cross bridge, and my other arm is the actin. With the phosphate group attached, the myosin head is extended, when it binds to the actin, it loses that phosphate group and that causes it to bend. Making sense so far? So what we have now is a bent myosin cross bridge that has just moved the actin a little bit. It's pulled itself along the actin. The next thing that happens is an ATP molecule comes in and binds to that head group. If I go back to my marker and cap analogy, here's the myosin head group. It just bound, lost its phosphate group, and made a little movement. Now an actin is going to come into the, or an ATP is going to come into the myosin head group. That's going to cause the myosin head group to release from the actin, to unbind. And the next thing that's going to happen is an ATPase, or a molecule that breaks apart ATP in the myosin head group, is going to dephosphorylate the ATP, or in my case of the marker, remove the cap. That's going to phosphorylate once again the myosin head group and cause it to extend. So now it's ready to bind once again to the actin and dephosphorylate and bend and then ATP will bind again and it will release we'll get phosphorylation it'll unbend and then it'll bond, bind to the actin again dephosphorylate and bend over and over and over again as long as the calcium is around allowing those myosin binding sites to be available Had to go back and add this. So if calcium's around, then the binding sites are available and the myosin crawls. If that nerve signal stops coming, then the action potentials going down the T-tubules stop and calcium is no longer released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The sarcoplasmic reticulum also has calcium pumps that pump the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So if the neuronal signal stops, if the neuronal signal stops, then calcium will stop being released and it will actually be pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Calcium levels will drop. Calcium will leave the troponin and tropomyosin will go back over the binding sites. So that explains how relaxation happens as well. I hope this makes sense. 
and I'm going to try and think of a way to present this better in this format. Um, I highly advise that you go look at the other digital animations that are out there to get a better idea of how this works. Um, and the websites that I tried to send you to within my class. So once again, thanks for watching. If I can help with any questions or anything, please email me or call me. And thanks again for watching.